Without further ado, I'm going to bring onto the stage the man, the myth, the legend, Tom Schnauz. I want to start hearing a little bit about how your career started. Um, you worked on the X-Files. How did you get started on those jobs? I went to NYU Film School and uh, spent a lot of years writing screenplays until I finally had one optioned. I've never had a screenplay made, but I've had things optioned, uh, which sort of started my full-time writing career. I joined the Guild back in 1994 um, and then was living in New York, uh, ran out of money, could not support myself as a screenwriter. Uh, so I knew Vince Gilligan from NYU. We had gone there together and I called him up asking him, you know, I'm thinking of moving to LA to try television. Screenwriting's not sustaining me. I need to take other jobs. And I just happened to call him when they were starting the X-Files spinoff, The Lone Gunman, and he said, you know the show, you know the characters, come up with some pitches and come out, fly out to Los Angeles, come pitch to Frank Spotnitz and John Scheiben and myself some ideas and see what happens. And I came up with like a list of like 30 ideas, whittled it down to six that I pitched to them. They liked one, they liked it enough that they hired me on the show. And then when The Lone Gunman got canceled, they liked me enough to put me on the X-Files and that got me into television. Do you remember your first writer's room? So when you were on The Lone Gunman and then The X-Files, what did you learn in those early rooms that have you know stuck with you and served you throughout your career? Yeah, I mean, early on, I it was listening to the voice of the showrunner. They'll pitch dialogue and just sort of pitch in the voices of different characters. And I remember listening very closely to how things were pitched and how they spoke in the characters' voices and carrying that onto the page and uh, getting a better response when I was sort of mirroring what was being pitched in the room as opposed to trying to reinvent something. So it was just listening to the voice of your of your showrunner and uh, putting that on the page. What have been the biggest changes in sort of the TV writing landscape since you started? I mean, obviously one of those is sort of the end of the DVD era and moving into the, the streaming era. I mean, the biggest one is the amount of episodes because I sort of got in at the tail end of, oh, we're doing 24 episodes in a season. I, I, I lived it. I was there for it. I cannot remember for the life of me, remember how it was done. Now the thought of doing eight episodes is exhausting <laughs> to me because I'm just old now. Back in the day, I was like, yeah, we're doing 24 episodes, guys. Let's do it. Roll up your sleeves. We're going to work weekends. We're going to work you know, insane hours. The beauty of Breaking Bad is that, you know, 13 episodes or, or eight episodes, you really got to work hard about making every episode as good as we could be. Whereas in a 24 episode season, you're just gonna have some stinkers. It's just, it's impossible <laughs> to keep up that kind of quality of work across the board. I mean, the actors get exhausted, the crew gets exhausted. Mm -hmm. When you were making those episodes that were stinkers, like, did, did you guys know that in the room? Was there just like the sense like, this is not gonna be a good one? I don't think, no, I think you try your best on every one and then just time runs out and you, you just like, we we have a, a date, we have to meet a mark. Whereas I think on the on Breaking Bad and, and Saul, we would go forward and we plot, we'd probably get seven or eight episodes broken uh, before shooting would, and that way if something felt wrong, we could go back and change it and make things right. Whereas in a, a regular TV production schedule, you write it, it's it's off to the races. They're they're producing it, they're making it, they're shooting it. And you're you're only an episode or two ahead of of what they're mm -hmm. shooting and it's more chaotic. So you're just trying your best just to stay ahead. I want to go through the whole process of talking about breaking story from the start of a new season. But first, I just want to show a picture. And this is kind of one of the things that you guys have become known for, what are we looking at right now? This is a, a, a storyboard for an episode that I wrote uh, called Bad Choice Road. And it is the work that all the writers in the writer's room did together, talking about every scene, every beat uh, of the story and distilling it down to a card, just what the scene's about. And we overcarded. These, these Saul episodes are sort of, uh, beyond what we did on the X-Files, where the X-Files was very specific, really distilling a scene down. This is, we we suffer from what was called card creep, where things would get a little 
uh, we put a little more detail in than we probably should have, but I think it was not a bad thing ultimately is that the more detail we had as a group, the better the episode was. Yeah, I think um, this is, you posted, these are X-Files cards, so they're just like shorter yes. um, on your Twitter in comparison to, um, if you look at these, yeah, if, if you, I don't know how well you guys can see this on your computers, but there is a lot of cinematic detail in there. And I think that's what you were kind of were talking about, like in terms of overcarding, you were going beyond just the bones of the story. Um, yeah, we we'll talk about opening, sh opening shots, we put dialogue in sometimes, but I think like act one, that's probably three or four scenes uh, right there. Mm -hmm. So, or on the X Files, it would only be a line of one line of cards. This is we have two lines of cards. We probably had to stack some in order to fit all the cards. So, what you saw there was all all my writing. Uh, I, I think as when Vince left the room, I sort of took over the duty of being the uh, the sharpie wielder. I remember the 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 card writing was just like very important like it, it was it was almost a ritualized yeah. thing it was uh i mean the way frank spotnitz used to describe it as kind of a zen it just helped you trying to fit what the scene is about onto a few cards really helped you focus on what is this scene about and is it important that it is in this story if it doesn't have a simple way to describe it and and why it leads from the previous scene you just wrote, then maybe you don't need it. And then the great thing about having it on cards as opposed to a whiteboard is that, oh man, maybe that's that beat would be later, great later in the episode, or maybe we put it early. It was very easy to, to, to move the puzzle around and see what the episode would look like in a different shape. So basically we're talking about beats of a story. And I feel like I don't know, there's a lot of chatter. People have different definitions of like what a beat actually is. It's one of those terms that depending on the screenwriter can mean different things. What is your definition of a beat? It's either a plot moment or an emotional character turn where a character, you know, what made this character go from happy to angry? Or what the surprise is, what, what are they shocked by? What, are they, what, what didn't they see coming? Another thing we were big on is what does a character tell themselves that this moment is about as opposed to what it's really about? What's the the driving what's the driving force that they don't understand so we put that in a card is that we try to put what the subtext is and and, mm -hmm. and and also what the characters are are telling themselves this is really about we had four boards dedicated to episodes we had two boards dedicated to a season which is where we would start we had two boards next to each other on one side of the room and they stayed up the entire season and we put across the top, we had 10 episodes. We do episode 101 through episode 110. And we just started talking globally, blue skying about what might happen in the season. What would be interesting? Throw some big ideas out there with some emotional ideas. If we want to get Jimmy from here to here, like season one, we probably had written at the end of episode 110, he's Saul Goodman. Jimmy, you know, we had the idea that Jimmy McGill was going to turn into Saul Goodman by episode 10. So we put a card up to say, Jimmy is Saul Goodman. You know, Jimmy's brother, you know, beats about his brother and just different big ideas. You know, Jimmy gets in a gunfight, whatever the, what do we, you know, what just fantasizing, what's a great big cool thing we'd want to see and just sort of put that stuff up on the board and say, oh, maybe that would happen around episode one, two, three, whatever, and just sort of lay it up. By the end of a season, none of that would match what we did in a season. It was just to get our minds to sort of maybe maybe have a, a loose roadmap of where you want to go. And we do that for like a month. Are you thinking at all in that process um, of the season, the, like the arc of the season, are you thinking of it as like a three act structure or any kind of formal way of like, we need a climb, we need rising action and, and a climax and a you know falling action? Yeah, we never, we never, took the screenplay format and said that this, I mean, you'd want to build to something. You try to think of what's a dramatic turn and put that near the end of the season. And what's a cool twist and that's the middle of the season. What's a set piece, what's a great set piece, whether it's a gunfight or a fight between the brothers or something and and find a place for that. You just kind of feel it out as you're mm -hmm. all talking together. You sort of get a feel of where you want to start. What's a hurdle that Jimmy has to overcome here and and, sort of build to that. Who does he meet? Who does he know? 
and you come up with characters that never saw the light of day. Then you go back to uh, the first episode and mm. start thinking, where do we want to start? What does our character need to accomplish? What is their, what's in their way to accomplishing this? When you're talking about the the characters there, how do you get into the um, their their head spaces, um, especially because you know they're drug manufacturers or you know very unique person you know circumstances, very unique characters. How do you get in those head spaces? You start from where they are. You think about what has happened before. If it's if you're just starting the series, you build a backstory and and think about what led them to the point that you're starting at and what do they want. Where's their head at? That was always. The question we'd ask for every character, where's their head at? What do they want? And then you think about, well, if they want this, then they have to do this. Um, but then another character wants X or Y or Z, and that might be in their way. You have to focus on the short-term wants of the characters. And that's what we, what we say, the characters lead us to what, where the story goes. That's how it happens because you're really just thinking, what do they want next and what are they telling themselves the reason they want it and what's the real reason you know walt tells himself i'm doing it for my family i'm doing i want to i'm going to die i want to leave my family all this money while in reality the storytellers are thinking well he's got some psychological issues of hasn't felt like he's been a man his whole life and he's been oppressed by his his boss bogdan at the at the the car wash and he's made to feel like shit. so he's overcoming a lot of things while he's really telling himself I want to I want to be a hero for my family and that's not the that's not the reason he does these stupid things do you remember any specific you know toughest corners you guys wrote yourself into and and how did you get out of it yeah all the time and that I mean I think if the writing is any good or the storytelling is any good it's because we were not afraid to get ourselves into a corner because hopefully if we, the writers, take several days figuring out how the hell do we get out of this? The person watching at home is not going to think, oh, well, they're going to do, oh, Walt's going to do this and get out of it. You know, it's because we were like, what the fuck do we do? And Vince would bang his head against the wall or, you know, whatever, <laughs> whatever, you know, we, or do we go back? Do we change everything? No, let's stick, let's figure out how to get, you know, the, the classic one is uh, my first season of Breaking Bad. We had Walt and Jesse in the RV and Hank rolls up and traps them and we yeah. were like how the fuck do they get out of this and right now it seems looking at the episode it seems simple but we had no idea we were like what we were like okay they drill a hole at the bottom of their rv and there's a there's a there's a storm drain down there and they go through the storm drain i mean we came up with the worst ideas which is key i'm going to say this now to all the people who are either in writers rooms or want to be in writers rooms you have to have a safe room where the worst ideas are accepted and not made fun of. You have to be able to say the dumbest thing possible because one of our mantras was, here's a bad pitch, maybe it'll lead to a good idea. And very often it does lead to a, a cool idea. Like some, it'll spark something in somebody else. So how does an idea become a card? So the thing we did on the, on the season board, which was lay out some possible things we would do that on an individual board and we'd write up our teaser act one through four and then come up with some ideas about what what's a good starting point what would we like to see what's a good ending point and kind of put those up in possible places of just to give us sort of a direction to go and then we go back to the beginning and say okay we're starting here what does the character want where's where's he going and then sometimes those uh, what we call blue cards because we we would write them in blue sharpie, as opposed yeah, I think to. I have some here right on this here image. Yeah. So well, yeah, what you see there is the later blue cards uh, were part of the original idea board of where we might go. Um, so there used to be blue cards in Act One, but then when we got into the very specific, what are the scenes? That's when the black carding would start, and we'd go through and write it. So this is an example of a board where things didn't really change drastically from our wish list of things to happen. Um, but there's some there's some gaps in there. And, and as you're writing, you get to like what needs to happen, what hasn't been, you know, just to make logical sense of 
to tell the story. What do we need to see? So it's figuring out when do we get into the scene? What don't we need to see? Where do we want to end it? Like what's, you always want to find, oh, what's the latest you get into the scene? What's the earliest you get out of a scene? As you're, th as you're talking about a scene. You kind of talk about the group processes there. Um, which I think is fascinating because in so many elements of life, people talk about something being done by committee. So in a show or in shows that you've worked on, which have such like tense scenes that are just like have very clear, direct lines. How do you get to that in a group setting? For whatever reason, the group, because it's a group of six or seven people pushing towards the same goal, it's not somebody... I think the problem where the problem comes in is who's somebody who's not part of the process starts throwing in ideas like, oh, there should be a wormhole or whatever. <laughs> like, wait, you don't understand what led us to get to yeah. this point of this character making decisions. It's like everybody's sort of rowing in the same direction. Where I think when things get dis distilled with too many voice, you know, too many voices is when. They're not part of the process that got you to the point you're at for this particular moment in the story. That's why when we shoot the scenes and have a writer on set and there's an actor reading it and the actor says, why the fuck would I say this? What is this about? Mm -hmm. The writer has been there the whole time and says, well, here's the thing. We, your, you know, the character wants this and has been from here and you, you're there to help explain the process of why the character is doing the thing that they're doing. And hopefully the actor goes, oh, and I understand now. <laughs> Which, it's, yeah, I mean, also in the in the in the room, that's also the importance of the showrunner, right? That like sort of their job is to keep everyone pointed towards yeah. the vision. Yeah. What are the elements of a good scene, in your opinion? Are there certain things like you're trying to get in the scene um, to make it, you know, really sing? Something surprising is always great something unexpected is always great it really depends on the moment in the story sometimes you want to give the audience two plus two and let it equals four and then sometimes you want to like have it be like where the hell is this going so it's different i mean as long as the characters are making logical decisions but can somehow still be surprising um again if it's surprise you know it's the it's the whole thing of having a character tell themselves oh, I'm doing it because of this but then there's some underlying psychological reason so that whatever weird thing they do still has to make sense on some level yeah I mean I would also say another aspect would be like you mentioned the characters right and like what do they want are they trying to accomplish something in that scene are there stakes what happens if they don't get it you know what happens if they do get it why why are they doing this are there multiple people with competing interests in the scene? You know, is there conflict there? What about the scenes in between those? You could call those filler scenes or the slow burn scenes. When you have these scenes where like big things aren't happening, how do you still make them interesting or engaging? I mean, the filler scenes have to be funny. They have to be emotional. They have to, you know, find the thing that makes the filler scene interesting. You can't, if you're just doing a filler scene to give the audience information that something's wrong, you have to find out why, what is what is the character doing in the scene that makes it interesting? It's like, yeah, you want to convey information to the audience, but their car's on fire or whatever, or they're trying to hide something from another character or whatever. What's the, what's the crazy, what's the thing in the scene that makes it engaging to watch? Once the episode is fully carded and we end up with, you know, this that we saw earlier, how do we go from this to to script? So for for Saul and for Breaking Bad, we'd uh, in order to keep AMC and Sony in the loop about what was going on, um, we do an outline, uh, like a ten-page outline based on those cards, and then after the outline was written, then we our writer's assistants would take all those cards, Xerox them onto <coughs> pages so that when the writer was writing it, they could cross off the scenes, the cards that they've written and just flip through and, and do all the scenes and, and just write a screenplay based on what you have there. 
What is your writing routine? Yeah, I was historically a nighttime writer. I would like wait until like 11 o'clock at night and then just write for several hours in the middle of the night. It was almost almost all of my stories. Then I had children. And then, <laughs> now I'm trying to write whatever the hell I can. Um, and it's very, you know, finding the writing time is, is very uh, hard sometimes. I think for the last couple of things I've done, once they've gone to bed, then I will stay up. But I just don't, I don't have the stamina I used to anymore. I found that kind of the opposite. I've, I've started doing a little early morning writing because I just tend to wake up and yeah. I've just, I've started keeping my laptop just like next to the bed and I'll just write and it's, it'll be yeah. dark sometimes. And it's the same thing. If the world can't bother you yet, it's, it's fantastic. Someone just asked how you deal with writer's block. Yeah, I mean, it's really let your mind free, find something, you know, I play guitar. I mean, when I write, I don't usually write in order. When we break an episode from the beginning, I will find a scene that I have a, a feel for, whether it's a, a funny mood or a dramatic mood, I'll find a scene that sort of speaking to me at the moment and I'll start there and I'll write that scene first and then kind of go back and do, do some scenes that I have a feel for. If you're stuck on something, find a thing that you love to do, whether it's, you know, Gordon Smith used to do Legos in the room, or, you know, again, I had the guitar just, for, you know, you want to be open to play. So find something to play with, whether it's a Rubik's Cube or, or a jigsaw puzzle or something that sort of gets your mind free. And a lot of times I will have my best ideas in the shower. Like I'll go yeah. home, I'll be stuck on a point, and then the next morning I'll, I'll wake up and shower, I'll be like, oh, there, I, I have something. What should happen in, in act one? Yeah, I mean, you want to sort of set the direction for where the story is going and just figure out where your character is in the beginning and what the goal is and how, you know, what's the direction, what's the hurdle they're going to overcome to get to the next step. So I think mm -hmm. that's really what you want to, and, you, and again, it's to get people to turn the page, you want something to surprising happen to happen pretty early on like what's what's an early twist or what's an early surprise that happens how do you write characters that you don't have any similarities to um especially you know yeah they mentioned tuco how do you make a character like tuco's actions believable if you if you've never met a tuco something i did in college was take acting classes and it's really i mean as a writer you should have even if you can't act, the knowledge of what it is for to be an actor in a scene and think about, you know, the character story. And it's really getting into a headspace of being a character. If you're a writer starting out, try to take some acting classes and understand how to break down a scene from an actor's perspective and figuring out where the peaks and valley, because that was something that I did in acting classes. So you, you take a scene like we did, uh, another student and I did a scene from the producers and I'm the Gene Wilder character. And you figure out what's the, the peaks and the valleys and, and, and you know, sort of, you know, graphing it out and where the highs and lows are and where the transitions are. From an acting standpoint, you're, none, none of your actors are actually who their characters are, but they have to come mm -hmm. up with a history and think, okay, if I'm this person, how do I act? How do I react? Uh, what are your influences? Are there any pieces of media that you would say have greatly influenced you? It, that'll change daily. I mean, I will come up with so many different answers. The thing that really uh, probably got me wanting to be in television was the show SCTV because it, I, it's like when I really first started looking at the credits of a TV show, I'm like, oh, the actors are writing their own stuff and they're really into making fun of television and really having this sharp take on it was like just so it's like man i wanted to, it was like something i wanted to be a part of so many great movies in history one flew over the cuckoo's nest is is my favorite film and it's really something that i when i watched it really had an influence on me and really if i, I could point to that movie and, and point to scenes and and saw and say oh i ripped that off from from that and, uh the marx brothers all the crazy writings of uh of uh, sj perlman and all that all the stuff that that led to making the Marx Brothers as crazy as they are. That, I mean, there's probably, I could probably sit here for 30 minutes and just talk about different yeah. things. 
I mean, I love like how many comedy things for a drama writer, like how many, I mean, I think that, that's one of the, my favorite things about, I think those shows, you know, Breaking Bad, Berker Saul is how funny they were. And I think a lot of shows get that wrong. If they try to do a, something in the style of Breaking Bad, they forget about the humor. Um, yeah. Don't take, I, yourself, don't take yourself too seriously and really find like dark. I've always loved dark humor. Um, and so any, any kind of dark, anything that's, dark and twisted but it still make you laugh i i love uh tom do you want to leave any parting words of wisdom uh to our <laughs> audience <laughs> oh god just the, the regular trope you know don't give up just yeah really i mean if, if you have a passion for writing you will find a way to to get it done i mean if just keep writing i mean i you would stay up so late at night before I actually optioned my first screenplay. It was like, you just keep writing and writing and writing until the thing. And it's a, it's a, it's a crap shoot, crap shoot. There's a lot of luck involved. It's if you keep writing, it's just getting that thing you love to the person who can actually get it made. It's like a lot of things have to happen, but as long as you keep throwing those darts at the wall and hopefully one of them sticks, uh, if you're passionate enough, you don't give up. You keep trying. If you're a writer who has not been uh, published yet or has not had a, anything made, keep doing it. 